My name is Valerie Smith. I'm public engagement with Irish Hospice Foundation. And um, my slides aren't moving properly. Oh, no, all right. Um, so I'm public engagement with Irish Hospice Foundation. I run Think Ahead, which is our advanced care planning program. So we'll be using that as an example of an advanced care planning tool that you can use today. Um, but anything that we discuss, you can you can adapt to uh, to your own practice as well. And that's so strange. That's not changing, but it's okay. Sorry, my back end is doing some funny stuff, but that's all right. We'll figure it out. And um, so, if you're not familiar with Irish Hospice Foundation, you you probably are because you're here on this um on this webinar today. But um, you know that a lot of times I do a lot of work in the community, and people I say I'm with Irish Hospice, and they say I live down in Cork, so they say oh I love Marymount, or if I'm in Dublin, they say oh my loved one was over in, uh you know Black Rock and and it was a very good experience generally very good feedback and i'm delighted to hear it but um you know irish hospice foundation we do the education the advocacy the training we build systems for better end of life care across systems so we do have um bereavement and end of life programs uh bereavement support lines in nursing homes in um uh, in hospitals in community settings as well um, so if you aren't familiar with us, we have a lot of things going on, and I just encourage you to check out the website, hospicefoundation.ie, for more resources. So for um, today's, oh, sorry, I want to start with this reminder, actually. I usually end with this quote, but I think it's a good one for today to kind of start off with this um, as we're talking about advanced care planning. If you haven't read it, one of my favorites um, books on this topic from Dr. Catherine Mannix, who wrote, you know, With the End in Mind, How to Live and Die Well. And she reminds us that talking about death won't make it happen, but not talking about it robs us of those choices and moments that will not come again. Um, so just starting us off with this reminder that these these conversations uh, get our gift that we can uh, make decisions and have really important conversations that that if we miss them, we don't get to necessarily have a second opportunity to do that. For today's training. Um, I, uh, you know, want to cover a few basics, you know, what is advanced care planning, um, understanding, you know, how this benefits uh, your patients, uh, their families, but also how it benefits yourself, that you feel more confident, you know, holding these conversations with your patients, um, and uh, that you're able to respond honestly to their questions. But I also, this is the first time that we're really doing something that I'm really doing something with GPs. And so I really want your feedback as well on what you need for uh, from us to help support you in this work. And so just that this is to say, this is the first conversation of this type that I'm having with GPs. We've worked with ICGP, we've worked with practice nurses, but this might be the first time that we're interacting. And so just to say that I hope this is only, only step one, only day one. And then this all kind of leads into what our goal overall for Think Ahead is, and this is all included in today, but it's really about this piece here, upholding patient wishes, their values and their treatment decisions through all stages of their life, including their end of life. And this is really what uh, I hope that you leave here with today. And I do hope that you're more or less familiar with the idea of advanced care planning, um, but uh, but if not, I, I'm, you're in the right place. Advanced care planning is really, it's thinking about, talking about, and telling others about what you want for your future care um, if you can't make that decision at the time. Um, I, you know, advanced care planning is kind of a phrase that we use that, uh, professionally, but with community members, there's research that shows that that kind of language doesn't really work, but future care planning is a lot easier for people to understand. So I'll, I'll use them kind of interchangeably today. But um, one definition that I really like from this um, is that advanced care planning is an ongoing process to prepare patients and their caregivers for future in the moment decisions. So an ongoing process to prepare patients, prepare patients for an in the moment decision. So when the mo when the decision is needed, these conversations have already begun happening. They've been ongoing, but really, it, so it's this thinking, thinking about talking about and telling others about your choices, your values, your preferences, um, and your decisions. 
It includes all of these sorts of things, making an enduring power of attorney. Patients may be coming to your, to your practice uh, for um, a capacity report. It's making an advanced healthcare directive and or designating a healthcare representative. Um, I, I had hoped to, I, I work with Age Friendly Ireland quite a bit. They have a great new initiative, the Healthy Age Friendly Homes Initiative. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get slides from them in time, um, but I just, let's see if I can do this. I'll put there that reference there uh, into the chat. That's fine. Um, uh, I can't add that into the chat, unfortunately. Sorry about that. Give me one second. Oh, technology. Sometimes, sometimes it works with us. Here we go. Age friendly. Back here. Um. So, oh gosh. So it's all of these different aspects are included. Oh, where did my stuff go? What's going on? Sorry about this. But my be jumping back and forth. There we go. Ah, there we go. So apologies for that technology. Um so it's all of these different things are included in future care planning. Um, and I'll be discussing some of them. I'm not a I'm not a, a master sort of on um, enduring power of attorney, but I do understand the new process to an extent, um, and I can I can address that somewhat. Um, and but I I do know quite a bit about advanced healthcare directives. That's really what we'll be talking with today. But I, I included that um, the link there to age friendly uh, healthy homes as well, which is an important piece of the conversation for people as they're planning ahead. How can they stay in their homes for longer? Recently, um, at, it, was, it was actually about palliative care, but I loved it. It's really, um, really important. I think it really translates over to advanced care planning as well, that advanced care planning is the umbrella, not the rain. The rain or the storm is the illness. It is reaching end of life. It is coming for us all at, at some point, and we will all face the storm. But if we can, we can face the storm with an umbrella as well. The earlier that we provide people kind of with the resources and the tools, the better prepared they'll be to face the storm, uh, uh, to face the rain as well. So advanced care planning, like palliative care, different process, different tools, um, but both there to support people as they're out in the rain. We think here at our Hospice Foundation that it is, you know, positive action that people can take. It reduces stress. It also reduces fear and anxiety as people approach end of life if they've done some planning ahead. It improves measures of quality of life as people approach end of life as well. And this last one, I always am sort of like not quite sure how to say it, but um, you know, it, it reduces medical interventions at the very, very end of life. And we see this where people have done advanced care planning or in countries where advanced care planning has been a little bit more common or, or around for a little bit longer time than is here. Um, you know, um, that those interventions at end of life, hospital interventions, um, uh, intubation, um, uh, CPR, these types of things are reduced when people have done future care planning. This isn't across the board for everybody. And that's why I kind of have in brackets, you know, it's not my role to determine what's necessary or unnecessary for somebody, but um, where we see that it, it wouldn't necessarily imp uh, lengthen a person's life or improve quality of life, then we can see a reduction. And so the focus comes back on patients receiving the care that they that they want and that matters to them. And there is a significant amount of evidence that shows how this is beneficial to patients. Um, you know, as I said, I work kind of across settings. So we see kind of lower readmission and ICU rates where people um, have uh, done advanced care planning in place. And there's a lot of conversation there between hospitals and, and nursing homes, for example, on, well, whose role is it? You know, if a person wants to be somewhere, how do we... Um, you know, go with their will and preference, but also, you know, make sure they're looked after properly. Advance and future care planning can um, can help to reduce rates of readmission if that's not helping a patient. Um, shared understanding and decision making, and this is discussing the patient, 
the, the family or the caregivers around them, as well as the healthcare providers. Um, I talk, kind of talked about improved quality of life already. I, I love this idea of enhanced hope. That one always stands out to me because, you know, we often think of the hope of the cure, hope of, you know, going home, hope of whatever it might be being better. And this um, can also include hope that my fares are in order. I receive the treatment that I want. I'm looked after in the way that I want to look after um, my paperwork's in order and all these sorts of things as well. So lots of um, evidence to support pay how, how advanced care planning benefits patients. It's practical. It's getting legal affairs in order if that's what matters to somebody. You know, I would include in here, even though obviously um, a will or funeral plans are, are, are beyond the care planning while a person's still living, that can be really important for people to have those things in place, practically in place um, for, for themselves um, before end of life. It's having that emotional support that they need, the people um, around them that they want to be around them as they're facing difficult decisions, having the emotional support to um, have kind of the framework to, to make those decisions and move through that. It's looking after the physical care of a person, of course, in terms of the treatment decisions that they might be needing to make. It can also address kind of existential and spiritual questions. It opens the door, obviously, as people face end of life, there can be, and for many there are, kind of questions of what's next, questions of acceptance, life review, all of these sorts of things can be enhanced through some um, you know, future planning as well. And it's social, it's looking at who, we, who we're who we around and how we kind of live our best life um, uh, through illness, through end of life as well. So all of these things are also, can be included depending on what matters to the individual, can be included in an advanced care plan. And I often ask this questions, especially when I'm working with healthcare professionals is, you know, when I'm saying that term, a good end of life or a good death, you might hear, you know, what does that include? And that pretty much I hear uh, not being in pain, not, not, not suffering and um, being around the people that I want to be around, ideally being where I want to be. Um, and if there's a chaplain or someone in the room, then so, sort of those more existential questions come in as well. But it's all of these things, um, all of these things can be looked at with a bit of advanced care planning. The whole person can be looked at through advanced care planning. But it's also beneficial, and this is really important for so many patients, as I'm sure you'd be able to tell me already, that this is about um, looking after the people around us as well. So the family, the friends, and the caregivers of the patient are also supported with advanced care planning. We see less conflict and more agreement. I think one of those uh, one of those studies that I pointed out there spoke to this, that it gets people on the same page. And um, people understand uh, like what is, uh, uh, what's decided upon is really what the person wants. And you hear a lot of times at the end of life or after someone's death, did we do enough? Did we uh, give them what they wanted? Was it the right care? And when you have a care plan in place, those types of things can be reduced. Um, and there's a story on this that I wanted to just touch on, which, which isn't actually about the, the care plan itself, but a way in to have this conversation. Um, you know, a colleague of mine what, attended a funeral of a neighbor of hers, and this family had always been, always been fighting conflict about everything. And she attended the funeral of, um, of the mother and the daughter uh, came up to her afterwards and said, oh, I just have to tell you, I have to tell you about think ahead and my colleague obviously she works with our hospice foundation she said well you know I actually I do know I do know about think ahead and she said no no I have to tell you I have to tell you it was just amazing you know she had everything written out what she wanted but she didn't want down to her funeral plans we didn't if we hadn't had that kind of draft on what she wanted we would have been fighting this whole time through this would have been a, a terrible day but instead it's brought us all together we're able to follow exactly what she wanted and we're able to be here and present and together and not fighting. And so it just kind of speaks to this idea that we can put our plans in place in order to ease some of the conflict for others around us at end of life. Now, for myself, you know, I'm always about the patient. I think the most important thing is that you as a patient, you as a person have what you want for yourself. But for a lot of people, that will be that their family isn't in conflict. And putting these th things down in writing, having these conversations over time, all of this can be addressed through some advanced or future care planning. Um, and that, that kind of speaks to what I was saying um, just a second ago there, that advanced care planning can lessen the grief of the caregivers or the family around an individual as well. Um, this reminder from Dame Cicely Saunders always speaks to that, that how people die remains in the memory of those who live on. And so, but if people know that they've 
um, uh, are following the directions of the person that they love, then they're not left with that kind of uh, uh, grief or ambiguous grief or, or that loss of not knowing if they've done everything. And so advanced care planning supports grief, it supports conflict as well. Advanced care planning is not a one-time conversation. Um, this is a series of what I like to call courageous conversations. They've been called lots of things. We've heard them called uh, challenging conversations, difficult conversations, bad news conversations, uh, um, compassionate conversations. My favorite way is courageous. Look, these are scary conversations to have uh, or if, if we're addressing them for the first time. It takes courage and it does take, you know, courage meaning kind of a bravery of the heart. It takes a compassion to do this as well. But there are a series of conversations that need to happen. Um, maybe from, and the conversations are really the most important thing. Maybe somebody puts a plan in place. Obviously in my role here, I do encourage people to put a plan in place and put that in writing or in a voice recording or a video recording. Um, maybe they put a healthcare directive in place that would include their medical decisions. But really, if we can understand what a person wants and we can have these conversations as much as possible, that's that's the most important thing and the most accessible thing for most people is that they're willing to have the conversations, willing to have their questions answered and be able to tell somebody what it is that they want for themselves. Um, this is sort of a guide, I think, to I've heard it be attributed to Aristotle. I've heard it be attributed to the Buddha, I've heard it be attributed to Gandhi, you know, is what you're saying, is it honest, is it kind, and is it helpful? And this is what it is to have a courageous conversation with, with patients about future planning. It needs to be honest, it needs to be compassionately delivered, and it needs to help them as well in their journey, whether that's an illness or whether that's just thinking ahead to what might happen in the future. Is it honest, is it kind, and is it helpful? So these conversations are, of course, they're person-centered um, based on what the individual's values are, based on their preferences, their decisions, uh, based on their questions and their fears as well. It needs to be honest in terms of their the impacts of their medical conditions and what is the likely outcome or what are some likely possibilities that their future might hold that they might start to think about based on their medical conditions if there's a known medical condition. They are capacity-based decisions, which means that we're working with them to assist in helping them make decisions, or there's a family member or somebody named to help make their decisions, help them make their decisions. Um, um, so as long as they have some capacity, even assisted capacity, they can be having these conversations, they can be putting plans in place. And as much as possible that it involves the people around them as well. So um, not everybody will want that. Not everybody will have that. But um, but that it is bringing as many people into this conversation and supporting them as well in these conversations. A lot of times what we see, um, actually this kind of speaks to that, um, that lots and lots of people are thinking about Co uh, are, are thinking about end of life because of COVID. They're thinking about it for the first time. They're talking to their friends and family about it. But we also find um, that a lot of patients are thinking about it or a lot of people are thinking about it, but they don't want to talk to their family about it. Maybe they want to talk to a friend. Or maybe they want to talk to a physician, but the family element can be um, very emotional. Uh, they don't want to upset somebody. And so having a professional who they can go to with their questions or who can open the door for them to say, you're welcome to come here with those questions. You're welcome to come here with those conversations can be so beneficial to people who, who aren't sure how to start approaching these conversations with other people close to them. But I say this also to say, you know, we can be a little bit afraid sometimes of entering these conversations with people, even as healthcare providers. I'm, I'm saying, I'm including myself in that royal we there. Um, but um, lots of people are thinking about this already. And so just to say, you know, um, for yourself to work through some of that fear as well, in case that is there, that they might already be thinking about it and are really looking for this place to go with these conversations. But with the, you know, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act, which covers so many things, um, and I'm not an expert on it all, but it basically allows a person to write, video record, or voice record their treatment decisions while they have capacity so that if they later lack that capacity, those decisions that they've made previously remain valid. They remain legal decisions. They can be written, re voice recorded, or video recorded. 
and they remain valid decisions. And this is, you know, that right to self-determination. Sage advocacy is a, a large number of resources there as well um, on these topics. And, and the big move here, again, I'm sure you're very familiar with this, and I'm sure you've probably been doing this in your work for a long time already, um, but, but this is the move from best interest of a patient to their known will and preference. So rather than us deciding what we think is best for them, we look at what we know about what they, uh, what they want, what they've decided, what they prefer. But of course, in order to follow what they've known, what they've decided, what they prefer, we have to know that. We have to have that recorded somewhere, where they have to have that recorded somewhere, where they have to have had these conversations. They have to make it known. Um, and for, you know, again, you, you most likely know this, and this is just to kind of highlight that um, a person who has um, a recent diagnosis of dementia is still, may still have good amount of capacity, um, or uh, a person who's, who's moving through illness may have a good amount of capacity still. It's the ability to make a decision in the moment about the decision that's needed. And so this capacity can change. Maybe a person has really good decision-making capacity in the morning, in the afternoon, maybe they need a bit of assistance and forget it in the evenings, not when we should be having these times. Um, so if they can understand those choices, weigh them out, choose one and explain it, again, even with a bit of assistance, they do have capacity. And um, I know Alzheimer's Society, for example, is saying, once you have a diagnosis, um, of Alzheimer's, make sure you start putting your paperwork in place. They're not saying it's too late. They say, put your now put your paperwork in place. Make sure that the enduring power of attorney is there, the advanced healthcare directive. So of course this varies person by person, but, um, but it is to say that even as, with assisted capacity, a person can make these decisions and can make these documents. So, you know, how we start, I have a few, few different things here. Um, on how you might start a conversation with patients. And there's a few different kind of tips here. The first being that, you know, if a patient is asking about their own future, has a change in their health status, is asking about palliative care, or change in their treatment, these are all really good points to start bringing in the conversations on future care planning. Now, I think, to be honest with you, I think the best time to start future care planning is long before it's ever needed. But um, considering where we are and that you'll have patients that have never thought about this before. These are all kind of what we might call, you know, trigger moments where it's important to, to start having the conversation with somebody. I think especially as there is um, a change in health status, as we're talking about treatment, we're also talking about, okay, and let's put plans in place. Hopefully you never need it. But if you do, you know, we do this with all of our patients and we do this with all of our patients at this point in their kind of healthcare journey. But like we said before, these aren't one-off conversations. So it's always about kind of leaving people, planting the seed with somebody, um, and then having a follow-up appointment to ask about, uh, or when they're coming back for a follow-up appointment to, to see what they've done, to see what questions they might have. If there's any type of group support that you're um, linking them to, that that group support might have, advanced care planning supports there as well. I certainly working in, um, in different settings that would have COPD support groups that are including this. I've worked with Parkinson's support groups as well. So they can discuss amongst themselves, you know, what are what are the symptoms that you're having? What's, um, you know, what's happening in your journey? What would you want? What would you want? And kind of a, a space where they can all talk about it pretty openly and understand each other. Uh, but routine appointments um, over and over to bring this up. Um, my, my goal is that by the time you turn 40, you've started putting these kind of plans in place because these are important for everybody in case of an accident, case of a sudden illness, you have you can have a plan in place. Um, and, and ideally that's really how it would go that by a certain point, you start having these conversations. If that point's been missed, they never put something in. Then once one of these kind of health, um, health warnings or, or health changes comes into place, then we include that in the treatment plan as well. But a few tips for good conversations um, are to record, to involve others, and then to kind of influence behavior. So when I'm saying record, I mean this quite literally. Um, and I know that people are a bit, can be a bit cautious about this one, but to voice record the conversations that you're having with patients about their treatment, about advanced care planning, so that they can then listen back to it later. Um, this is particularly good. As we know, most patients, uh, you know, you can't take everything in that's being said to you in, in a big kind of uh, a meeting with somebody. And where this has been done before, um, 
they're having, you know, they sent this off to their legal teams and they said, are we going to get in a lot of trouble for this? Is this going to put us at risk? And what they found, the advice from the legal team was, no, this protects you. This protects you because it's very clear. You're being very clear about what you're saying. There's a recording of it. If there's any question, we can go back to it. And you're protected by recording these conversations. Um, obviously, patients would hear something through one ear and say out kind of something else, you know, through tell somebody else that doesn't make sense there at all, but might hear something and, and express that differently to the people around them. So if you can record that conversation, then everybody can hear. Involving more people in these conversations as much as possible, particularly if you're working uh, with people who do have um, some capacity issues um, or, or while having a, a conversation about difficult illnesses and so on, involving other people as much as possible in these conversations is um, as as your patients are open to it are, are essential. But really this last one, this idea of influencing um, how they receive the information. And there's been research done that shows that, um, again, moving from this kind of idea of we're delivering bad news to we're having a courageous conversation, how you phrase this conversation and working with your patients influences how they receive that information. Um, and so if you're saying this is a positive step that you can take for yourself that's going to reduce stress and fear and this and that, and it's going to help you receive the treatments that you want and so on, um, then that helps the patients as well receive this as something beneficial for themselves. So it's kind of like this idea of a placebo effect through just how we deliver this news to, to our patients. Um, so a few, yeah, how we start these conversations as early as possible if something unexpected happens. So this is when you're talking to somebody who's generally uh, relatively healthy or even might be um, ill, but is doing fairly well. If something unexpected happens in your illness, if something unexpected happens in the day-to-day, -day, what matters to you? What, what values uh, do you want to make sure that we're, uh, that we're meeting? What kind of treatments uh, would be appropriate for you in an emergency situation? Um, and to get those types of things recorded. Then, then there are these sort of other you know, options as well. If there's significant deterioration in somebody's well-being, if somebody's been admitted to hospital three times in a year and they're not improving. So this is um, a warning that's, uh, I'm not, I don't like that word warning, but this is something that's being put in place um, in parts of the UK. So if people are over 70, they've been admitted three times to the hospital in a year and they're not improving and they haven't started advanced care planning, now we put that into place. Now we start putting that into place. Um, if there is a diagnosis of a, of a life-limiting illness to have kind of, you know, a, a conversation with them about what that future might hold for them, what they understand, um, what else you might have seen and, and how, um, what options they have then, what, what possible choices they might have to make in the future and to start thinking about that. If they're asking about planning ahead or their legacy, um, you know, what are the most important things that they want to let you know about their care? And then where can you direct them as well? Is that, um, you know, is that legal basis? Is that medical? Is that what they want to leave behind? These sorts of things can all open up this conversation about future care planning. Um, but then again, a really important one is if you know that their decisions might differ from what their consultant would say or acute um, healthcare professionals might might recommend. If you know that their decisions differ from that, um, it's about letting them know that they have that right to make decisions, but they do have to make sure that those decisions are then documented, particularly if they would differ from what um, somebody might recommend them. So it can be really broad in how we have these conversations, but it's looking for different clues that might be kind of the right time to start having a conversation with them. Um, and this one uh, was a great one that was I recommended Dr. Sarah Fitzgibbon, I think is her name. Um, and she's a doctor down here in Cork. And she said, you know, I'll start this conversation with my patients, for example, if they complain about the music at a funeral that they just went to. Then she says, OK, well, what music, you know, would you want to have or what would matter to you there? And it opens up this way in that they can complain about something and say something they didn't like, but it can bring the conversation back to what is it that you would want? What matters to you as you're looking at this? And so certainly as you're working with people, you might um, find that they're coming to you and saying, oh, this, can you believe such and such a thing happened? And then you have the option option to kind of bring it back around to them. What is it that you would want? 
And this is, you know, the platinum rule. So we all know the golden rule, treat others the way we want to be treated, but the platinum rule, treat others the way they want to be treated. And this is what advanced care planning is about, understanding the way that they want to be treated if they're not able to kind of express that for themselves in the future, really getting to the heart of their own values and their own priorities there. This is my future. Um, <laughs> so I'd like to go, I'd like to have a nice big party at the end of my life. Friends and family around, I'd like to celebrate it. I'd like to, you know, go out in style, go with my eyes wide open. Um, and, uh, you know, I talk about and life stuff with the people around me all the time. They're not ready for this party yet, but I do hope um, that that the comfort that I'm trying to bring to these conversations will mean that when it is time for something like this, that people are ready for it as well. And I know that this isn't everybody's goal, but I do hope that um, advanced care planning and the so many resources that are coming out at the moment to aid in these conversations, including Think Ahead, uh, can help move us in this direction or whatever direction is that that our patients or that your patients are are looking to go toward. So for this next phase or this next um, few um, slides, I'm going to go through really pretty briefly our version of a, an advanced care plan. Um, I um, will. I'm going to have to do the thing where I exit out of this and then struggle to come back into it, but I'm going to put um, the links to the documents into the chat so that you can easily download those as well. They're free for download um, or you can, they're available in, in hard copy for purchase. And um, so I'll have those there for you as well. But what is Think Ahead? Think Ahead are documents that speak for you, for your patients when they cannot speak for themselves. So they never um, take over the voice of a person while they have the capacity and to, to make and express decisions. But if it comes to the time where they don't, then we have this recorded information on them. So the Think Ahead Planning Pack, it has three different documents. I'm going to go through them, the Personal Wishes and Care Plan, the Advanced Healthcare Directive, and the Medical Summary Form. It's written in plain English. Um, so we've done a lot to make it as readable as possible. Uh, we've worked with Nala uh, to to get this down. We'll continue to we'll continue to do that because it is a lot of information for somebody to take in on their own. It's a customizable document, so they can use these as their own care plan, or can teach them how to make their own. And on that point, just to say um, that Think Ahead is not the only resource in Ireland. We know the HSE and the Decision Support Service will have one coming. We we think very very soon. Um, and there may be others out there as well. Certainly, Let Me Decide is one that's been around in the past that a patient may have used before. Um, and a person can write their own documents. They don't have to use any of these templates. And neither do you, um, but sure it's there and you can use it if you want to. Uh, we do have the online resource, thinkahead.ie, that has um, a number of different prompts and resources uh, for people thinking about what they want for themselves. And then we've got this public awareness kind of campaign going on. You may have seen versions of this previously. So we have kind of this um, is our previous edition there. 2014, 2016 was the more recent one. And this is always a reminder to me that that if a person has one of these documents previously written before 2023 with this new legislation, it's still valid. They're not required to complete anything new um, just because the legislation's changed. If they're writing something for the first time or they're updating it, it has to meet the current legislation. But if they have something from previous, this is still a valid document. Um, they also don't have to be written in English. They can be written in another language, though obviously they may need to be translated at some point. Um, and they, if a patient is bringing one from another country and it meets the same basic criteria, it doesn't need to be up it doesn't need to be rewritten either. So they, you know, really is looking at the patient's will and preference, you know, no matter what format that's in. So the personal wishes and care plan, and I'm going to get this. This is what that looks like there. I think you can see that. Oops. Um, so I've just put the link to that there and feel free to um, feel free to look through that. Sorry, this is why I didn't want to exit out. Where did it go? This is, I don't want to do this. Oh, here we go.
All right. I'm going to put the other ones in here so that as soon as I uh, can get back on the screen, I don't lose it again because I am having, I'm really struggling with that. So you'll have all, oops, you'll have all three of these documents um, in the chat there for you. And apologies as I struggle through to bring myself back here. Okay, so you can see that again. Thanks for your patience with me there. So if you have them all in the chat, feel free to kind of link into those to take a peek. And the personal wishes and care plan is not a legally binding document. And this could be very useful to a patient um, who doesn't want to do the kind of medical decisions, but they want to start having conversations about different priorities or different values uh, that they do want recorded. So all sorts of things can be covered in the personal wishes and care plan. I can go back if you need to take another moment kind of looking at those um, bits there. But it's things like your financial records. And um, so especially if a person has an enduring power of attorney, it could be important for them to record where uh, where their accounts are stored, where their pension is coming from, and so on. Um, so they have kind of the basic understanding of, 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 of how financially they need to be looked after. This is also beneficial for people after a death, but at least uh, many of the things that might need to have name changes or, um, or death uh, records updated um, uh, can be updated and it's known where those things are stored. Place of care is a really important one here and I'm going to kind of highlight this as well, especially if there's any kind of um, out of out of hours GPs on the call today, you know, where a person wants to be cared for is not a legally binding decision and it shouldn't be, but it's really important to kind of judge from a person where is it that they want to be. Um, and so this allows kind of, you'll see, you know, if, if my health worse, my health worsens, would you prefer to move to hospital or would you prefer to be cared for as much as possible where you where you are? So they have kind of the option there of, of defining where they prefer to be cared for. And then play, things like AFI, healthy age-friendly homes um, might be able to come into place or it can help to um, alleviate some of that pressure between whether or not to move a person back to hospital if they're in their final days or final uh, weeks of life. And also has after death and funeral arrangements. So for example, for that patient who's saying, I can't believe what music they played at their funeral. If they wanna write down and make sure that the, those, those wrong songs are not played at theirs, this is the place for them to do this. Um, might have information on, you know, have you made a will and where is that stored and this sort of information as well. So all kinds of things are covered in the, um, uh, the personal wishes and care plan. There's a couple of pages in here, it looks slightly different than this, but. And um, that's just about how a person likes to be looked after. So, so literally, if you can't tell people that you tend to run very cold and you like to have the fire going, this is a place for you to put it in there. Um, this is a place for a person to explain kind of what their spiritual or religious preferences might be at the end of life. Do they want the priest visiting or not? Are there other kind of cultural cultural things they'd like included? Um, uh, 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 what kind of sounds do you like to have around? Do you want to have, what's your favorite radio station or favorite music to have playing? So this can be really um, helpful to people who might have home help coming in, who might have a public health nurse popping by or staying for a while, who might have nurses for night care coming in, kind of looking after somebody, just to kind of explain who this person is and how you like to be looked after. And, and again, these documents, because these ones, all of this included here, are not um, legally binding. They can be put together by family members as well. I, I, as much as possible to allow a person to make their own, but if a person is um, beyond the point of making their own, um, families can kind of use this as a template for thinking about the kind of care that they want for their loved one as well. So this kind of comes back to this main question, you know, what's the most important thing to you at the end of your life? The second document is the medical decisions uh, document, the healthcare directive. This is the legally binding document. And this would be where a person yeah, is allowed to um, make certain medical decisions ahead of time. Within an advanced healthcare directive, patients can do three things. Uh, they can refuse certain treatments, they can request or consent to treatments, and they can appoint somebody to speak and act on their behalf. 
for making medical decisions. Once it's witnessed and signed, then it's legally binding. Um, and this is where I hope and I encourage people to speak with uh, their medical professionals in their lives, whether it's a consultant or a GP, about what their future might hold. And I encourage you to respond to them honestly and openly about what their options might be and compassionately, of course. Um, but a patient isn't required. To, they don't need any type of medical approval for anything that they're putting in here. They don't need um, a, a capacity assessment for this. So they don't have to go to you with this, but I really encourage that they do so that they can receive a full kind of understanding of what their options are and that they can make those decisions from there. Especially, you know, this document, there's 10 pages of directions and we have to have those pages because it's a step-by-step -step guide on how to make these documents, but it can be quite overwhelming, um, particularly for older people, um, uh, particularly for um, more isolated people as well, uh, who I think it's important to kind of be able to discuss and, and tease out the questions from this because it is such an important document with a lot of information in it. So again, we've done our best to make it as readable and as, as approachable as possible, but there are quite a few things um, that could lead to questions for patients. So the first, you know, within these documents, they can refuse or consent to any type of treatment. And this is kind of that first big question because um, this is not just end of life treatments or not just um, emergency life sustaining treatments. It could also be therapeutic treatments, diagnostic or palliative, any type of treatment can be uh, refused or consented to in advance. It can cover physical health, or mental health, and a patient is even allowed to have two different documents, one for physical and one for mental health if they have different needs there as well. Um, most places where we've seen advanced healthcare directives are really referring to these life-sustaining treatments at the end of life, um, but here they are broader than that, but it is certainly including up to and including life-sustaining treatments. Um, so it is, yeah, life sustaining, but it's also things like chemotherapy. If there is certain um, medication, for example, if they were if they're living with cancer, there's certain medication that they are uh, that doesn't suit them well. They can refuse that medication. They could uh, uh, refuse any type of any type of treatment whatsoever, surgery or biopsy, or anything at all. They can also consent to this in advance if needed. Consent, well, I'll get into there in a second, but it's not as necessary because generally we're always offered. Um, the treatment that's appropriate and the treatment that would help. Um, but uh, so refusals are, are are more important, I think, for people to record here. But I certainly know um, from working in the community that, you know, letting people know we we need to understand the full picture of what it is you want and, and what it is you don't want. And so I often start with saying, you know, let's record what kind of thing, what kind of treatments you absolutely know you would want. And we'll get those kind of down first or understood first. And then we can talk about what you wouldn't want. And that's an easier way for some people in who might be a bit more reluctant to these conversations as well. Um, there are certain limits on what you can refuse and request. So you may not refuse basic care. And, and this is important. I think people do think that if they're refusing treatments, that they're refusing, once I've refused a life-sustaining treatment, I've refused everything. And obviously we know that isn't the case, but there can be that perception among people. So as a reminder, they're always shelter, warmth, food and water, hygiene, compassion. These are all offered to patients always, and they can't refuse these certain types of basic care, but they may refuse any type of intervention, medical intervention, and that doesn't affect the type of care that they receive elsewhere. And of course, in terms of requests, that's limited to what's legal in Ireland. Um, they, if they can certainly put into writing what they would want, but only what's offered to them will be what's, what's legal and available here in Ireland. When we're refusing treatments, this is what our documents look like. The most recent version of the HSC draft looks like this as well. Um, again, we are expecting theirs to come out soon. And if it's appropriate, then we'll update ours to match theirs. We want, we don't want there to be any type of confusion between the documents, even though they're not, nobody's required to use any specific template. But just in case you can't see that clearly, it names the specific treatment you don't, don't want, the circumstances that that refusal applies in, and then, you know, does a question sort of does that refusal apply even if your life is at risk? So it just has, 
patients have to be very, very specific on what they are refusing and under what circumstances. When requesting, so there's a, a confusion here between request and consent. Um, the legal uh, version of the AGMA refer to it as request. The codes of practice refer to it as consent, which is, I think, a, an important change because what, you, what a patient is doing is saying that they would con give consent in advance of need if it's appropriate, if it's available, et cetera. So um, they can request anything, but it isn't fully legally binding. The refusals here, these would be fully legally binding. If they refuse a treatment, they will not be offered it. But a request um, or consent is saying, if this treatment is available, would you give your consent in advance? And that has to be taken into consideration. Just because a person consent doesn't mean it's appropriate. So um, I might you know, request or consent to ventilation, but if that's actually not the treatment or the intervention that I need, then I won't receive that treatment. Um, but it just is a plate that allows a patient to give their full expression of, of what it is that they would want. It might be unavailable, might not be likely to work, might not be the appropriate treatment. So for any number of reasons, requests can be denied, but what they have refused is fully legally binding. Refusals are fully legally binding. Consent needs to be taken into consideration. The third thing, and I do think that this is the most important thing that a person can do, is to designate a healthcare representative. And this is um, uh, somebody who agrees to this role, and you can have a, a primary and an alternate, somebody who agrees to it, um, who would make final decisions on your behalf, it can be a family member, but it does not have to be. So it can be a neighbor, a colleague, a friend, um, someone that you trust generally to do this. Um, GPs are not allowed to be a designated healthcare representative. Um, if you're considered in a paid caring position um, and you're unrelated to the patient, then you cannot be their designated healthcare representative. If you're married to somebody, you're the GP, you're married to somebody, you can be their designated healthcare representative, no problem, or another family member, that's fine. Um, but if you're unrelated to them and you're their GP, you can't be um, a, a designated healthcare representative. And what does this person do? At the very basic, what they do is they ensure compliance with any refusals, and any requests that the people have made um, that the person has put into their directive. So there are another set of eyes. They can advise if the directive is unclear, the situation's somewhat different, they can advise there. But they can also be given sort of the additional responsibility of interpreting, advising and consenting on their treatments that are not included in that directive as well. It does have to be based on their known will and preference, but this allows a person to say, you know, um, I know who it is that I would um, name in this role. So we don't have time um, to kind of go into this, but I'll send this out to everybody who's registered on today's um, thing. We have a few short videos that are out now. Um, and this is an easy explainer video for, uh, for community members that why they would need to name a designated healthcare representative versus relying on that idea of next of kin. But but just to summarize that, for example, if you have uh, uh, four children and two of them think one thing and the other two think the other thing and everybody's considered next of kin, then you're left with conflict on deciding how to look after somebody. Whereas if you've named who you would like to look after you, what you would, uh, what treatments you would refuse and consent to, then you get to avoid that conflict and you receive the care that you want to receive. Uh, so I'm gonna skip. If in the future, Sorry. you're in a situation. I'll send that out so you'll have that document there or have that video as well. Um, Just to summarize that there's no legal standing, no hierarchy of next of kin. And so in the best of cases, the healthcare teams are working with the people close to you to decide on treatment. And in the worst of cases, they might actually make a different decision than the people close to you think is best. So naming a designated healthcare representative is sort of legally naming your next of kin. Who is it that you want to make these decisions for you? Um, and it, it, it puts the, the control back in the patient's hands there. So 
once that's completed, it's signed and it's witnessed and it's it's legally binding. Now, the issue, the primary issue at the moment is that there is no um, uh, register for these documents. And so copies, it's the responsibility of the person making these documents to make copies and share them uh, with yourselves, with their family members, with a consultant, um, so that when and if needed, copies are easily accessible. We are advocating for uh, a register and it does seem like there will be one in the future, um, but I don't have any sort of timeline for that at the moment. To kind of ease that, we have made the medical summary form, which is just a one page leaflet. Looks like this on one side, looks like this on the other side. And this summarizes, it's not a legally binding document, but it summarizes what's been recorded in the other two, and it's more easily added to a patient's file. So um, instead of including their whole healthcare directive, you might have this, um, and then if an emergency happens, you have it easily accessible, you know who to call to get the full document or where the full document is stored so that that can be accessed if it's needed and if there's time to make those decisions. I have another video that's coming up after this slide that I'll send as well. Um, and this is just to say that advanced healthcare directives do protect healthcare professionals. It protects you from having to make difficult decisions and it also protects you from cri criminal and civil liability if you follow the directives, especially the refusals and listening to those designated healthcare representatives. Um, and so if you're following the, 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 the PACs, um, then you are protected as well. So with that said, I'm going to skip this next video in the in the interest of time but you'll have it a link to it um in the email that i the follow-up email that i send out didn't realize that i had to through. so a few of the challenges with advanced care planning of course i can't i can't pretend that these don't exist um, you know, people might be unwilling to discuss the future, and that's completely um, up to, you know, completely up to them. This is about choice, and a person is allowed to say, look, I never want to, I don't want to plan this, I don't want to do this at all. Um, consent versus refusal of treatment, really under helping them understand what's legally binding versus uh, the refusals versus what's uh, advisory, which is consent. Um, documentation of longer discussions. So if you are having these conversations with patients, uh, you know, how do we document that? And that's just, that's not only on you, but that's on all these different settings as well. Um, and, but that's an issue, you know, of how to make sure that we're documenting all these, these conversations correctly. Lack of a register, of course, understanding next of kin and a designated healthcare representative. You know, these are all challenges that we're working through and ideally, hopefully providing you with resources as well to to um, address these challenges. There are a number of um, media resources um, that can help with starting a conversation as well. So if people are thinking about it, they don't know how to start talking about it, you might recommend one of these from the last year. Baz and Nancy's Last Orders was a, a really good one on RT1, kind of fun. I laughed, I cried. Um, uh, uh, and a good way to kind of say, oh, you know, did you happen to watch that? And, and, um, and, you know, what did it make you think of, or did it give you any kind of food for thought? Mary Kennedy Fad Sale on TG Her last year, really great one on, on aging well. And there's a piece in there on Think Ahead and a woman who's uh, living alone and wanted to have her plans in place um, very practically so that if and when needed, they're ready to go. But just as a reminder that these are, are this is planting seeds and it really is, it's on the patient to complete them um, and it will take them time. It takes people several kind of conversations and a few months, certain at minimum to kind of put these things together. Um, but if they start with what they know they want, they know they don't want, then they're off to a really, really good start there. Like, I hope that this is just the beginning of a conversation with you. Um, if you have questions, if you have feedback, if you're letting me know what you need to help have these conversations with your patients better, we can work uh, to create those tools, uh, we can work to help create those trainings that are needed, anything that we can to support you in having these conversations.